presentations looking at education as it moves into the future. This is the first in a series of presentations where we're looking at evidence. What does the evidence from research tell us about various issues? In this series we'll look at several issues and see what the evidence actually tells us. We start by looking at what research reveals about how we all learn. What does the evidence from research show? Learning is a bit like mountaineering. It can be hard going. You've got to work together. When you're part the way up, you're going to look back and you can see you've made quite some achievement. And even when the summit seems to be in sight, there's still more to climb. We could think of education like a stairway. The teachers have got to the landing part of the way up, because teachers are still learning and moving on. But the poor learners are near to the bottom, looking up the education stairs and saying, how will I ever make it? We've got to remember that we're looking down the slope. We forget about some of the problems. But for the learner looking up, they scratch their head and say, how will I ever get my head around this? We've all got different pictures about what we mean by learning. Too much today learning has been centred on written books and written examinations. And we forget about some of the other wonderfully important skills that are a part of learning. That's what is so often thought. Learning means listening to a teacher who's the expert. We memorise what the teacher tells us and then we recall it in the examination to get a good grade. That's how the media tend to present it. And that is so often the way that's seen in the public mind. It's like the teacher taking a, a jug full of facts, full of information, things to be memorised, and kind of pouring it into our brains, hoping that it'll stick. We've got to ask, is this education at all? Is this what it's really about? But tragically, that's too often the public image, and in some cases, it reflects what's going on. This is not complete, but let's look at education as gaining understanding. When we understand something, then we can apply that understanding in a novel situation with a good prospect of success. There's a description of what we mean by understanding. The evidence for understanding is being able to apply, despite what Bloom's taxonomy said. Here's another area, another important part of education. We're developing skills, a very wide range of skills. Thinking skills, practical skills, intellectual skills, personal skills, social skills, indeed confidence that we believe we can and we can move forward. But education also involves attitudes. That's a huge area, but I just pick up one or two here. How we begin to understand what our role is as the learner and what is the role of the teacher, indeed how the teacher understands their role and the role of the learner. So education involves understanding, skills and attitudes. It's far more than memorising information. That's a tragic truth. You can see it all over the literature and books of, that relate to the wider world. 
Everyone thinks they know because they once went to school, and education is full of opinion and assertion. It's a world where fallacies flourish. Now we're going to build this round a few fallacies and look at what the evidence suggests. But first of all, fallacy one. That's what people often think. All this research and learning is a waste of time. We're all different. We just decide what theory we like and we follow it. Just to suit ourselves, because we're all different. Well, the evidence does not support that. It's not true. And we're going to unpack the evidence. We've looked at learning. And the evidence starts by looking at what we really mean by learning, particularly the central skill of understanding. And I'm going to suggest that that is the central skill that captures almost everything in education. A lifelong process of seeking to gain understanding. That involves gaining skills. It involves in developing attitudes as we gain understanding. We equip ourselves for life, and it goes on throughout life. Now that statement is worth looking at and pondering, indeed with a group discussing it. Does it capture everything? The story we're going to tell in this presentation is a story of some very able researchers. I'm going to focus on just a handful, but there are a number of others. It took a lot of hard work, a lot of struggle, a lot of careful observation and work as these great people studied the key principles understanding the way all humans seek to understand. How do we do it? What are the principles? And they discovered there are common principles that apply to us all. Here are the key people we're going to focus around a long time ago. Herman Ebbinghaus. In the early days of psychology and education, he looked at the way we memorized information where there is no apparent meaning or pattern. His work was meticulous and painstaking. Many of you will have heard of Jean Piaget, Swiss-French psychologist, biologist, philosopher. His careful observational work, working with young children, and he found that they were trying to make sense of their environment. You may not have heard of Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist. Very short lifespan and he demonstrated in that short life, in his great research, how learning involves interrelationships between people. But he was looking at the developmental side of learning. Robert Gagné, working in a totally different area. <clears throat> he was looking at the area of training, training with young adults particularly, with the acquisition of skills, so important. They've got to be automated, and how sequencing is important in this. Then the famous educational psychologist David Osubel, He looked at how previous understanding is critical in gaining new understanding, but he also separated teaching strategies and methods from learning success, a brilliant insight from his observations and findings. Almost a contemporary, Jerome Brunner, <coughs> focused on discovery learning, which led to guided discovering learning, and we'll look at some of the great success of that. And Alex X. Johnson, he focused on and his work led to the ideas of limited working memory capacity. He was looking at the question, why do learners find certain topics difficult to understand? And his work led over many decades to brilliant insights that underpin 
our learning as understanding today. So we're going to look at each of these. We'll start with Herman Ebbinghaus. From a long time ago, he looked at memory and recall. He published a very large book, which has been translated since into English because he wrote in German. But he established two key principles. That's what we human beings are designed to do, to make sense of things, not to memorize. We're trying to make sense of things, and we can't make sense, sense of things. Memorization becomes very, very difficult. But what we already know helps us to make sense of things. They impose a kind of framework on our understanding. Now, others have picked these ideas up, but he laid the foundations, which is why I mentioned the great man here. Jean Piaget. Trained originally as a biologist, he had school teaching experience so valuable, and his interest then moved to psychology, which he came into from a biological perspective. And he saw the child as an organism growing in an environment, and the development of the child, he studied that, and how they adapt to their surroundings. And again, like Ebbinghaus, he realized that the child tries to make sense of the objects around him. Very different type of research, same broad conclusion. And the child constructs understandings through experiences provided by everything that happens in life. And they don't always get it right. They may make mistakes, but further experiences usually correct these. It's a natural process. And in his observations, which were carefully carried through, he was able to describe a series of stages of cognitive development and that every child passed through in the same sequence, at approximately the same ages. Yes, we do all learn the same way. There are common structures across the whole human race, and understanding these can provide a framework to help us in teaching today. So we can summarize his great findings this way. We all construct our own understandings in our attempts to make sense of everything in life. Young children, he was talking about very young children, from nursery to primary and into the very early stages of secondary, they go through a series of stages. But that's the natural way to learn. It's not memorization. That's not natural. We're quite good at it, but it's not natural. That's what we naturally want to do. Now, in teaching, we've got to build on that and capture that and seek to develop it because it's natural. Now, Vygotsky, you'll notice he had a very short lifespan. Tragically, he died at a very young age of tuberculosis, a Russian citizen. So the only picture we have of him is of a young man. He ran in parallel to Piaget. Piaget focused on the child interacting with the environment. Vygotsky focused on the child interacting with others. They're not in competition. Two perspectives that throw light on each other. His book was suppressed under communism for a reason that's not easy to see today, but was eventually published in English in 1962. And he observed that when a young child, he's talking about very young children, they can be pulled forward cognitively so they could solve problems better if there's someone alongside them who's just a little bit ahead of them. He also observed in his careful observation that language develops as you do things, but language gives you a tool to be able to plan and understand and do things. And the support could draw the child forward cognitively. But there were limits, strict limits. What he might have discovered if his work had gone further, we can only leave to our imaginations. 
summarizing his work, yes, we don't learn in isolation. And the importance of language as a tool for thinking, it gives us a way to conceptualize thought and ideas. And you can accelerate cognitive development, but it's only to a small extent. Piaget's idea of the cognitive stages still stands. Put the two together, we could ask the question, how do they make sense of each other? They're complementary. Piaget didn't get access to Vygotsky's work because it was suppressed. Vygotsky probably had access to Piaget's work. <clears throat> but together they paint a beautiful picture that helps us today. You see, teaching is not simply pouring the contents of my brain into your brain. That's a 19th century idea. Yet we still hang on to it. We still see it in cultures today. Genuine learning is sense-making. We're trying to understand. And the young child goes through a series of cognitive stages and these control the way we make sense of things. But we all make sense of things in our own way, idiosyncratically. We do it in our own way. Vygotsky showed that the cognitive development could be enhanced with a young child or somebody who's just slightly ahead. You see this with a family. But if you've got an older brother or sister, the older brother and sister can pull ahead the development of the younger child very slightly in the early years of life. And we construct meaning. But the meaning we construct may not be the accepted meaning that wider society accepts. That will correct itself in time. And it's true for everyone. Yes, we can study learning because there are principles that apply to us all. There is an assumption that if we measure the understanding of a class or a school, then we're getting a measure of the quality of teaching. That's simply not true. Good teaching and good understanding are not neatly related in that way. You can teach well, you can prepare well, but there is no guarantee that the learners will have understood what you've taught them as you intended. There are so many other factors that come into that and the idea of measuring teachers or schools or even nations by looking at exam results is a complete fallacy. It's an utter nonsense and the research evidence is totally clear cut. We'll explore that in more detail in a later presentation. Let's move on, on to David Ojibo. A long and prolific career as a young man like every good researcher, he built on the work of others. He was very familiar with Piaget, for example. But his work was focusing on meaningful learning, making sense of, in an ordinary classroom situation in his country, the USA. And he distinguished this meaningful learning from rote learning. And he gave us a useful clarification. He was trying to see how can we make learning more meaningful. And this is what he found. The teacher presents new material to us. Now it could be directly, could be through a discussion group, could be through a video, a computer program, a textbook, could be any way. But new material is presented to us, created somewhere by a teacher. But we've already got in our minds things we understand. And if you're going to get meaningful learning, you've got to link the two together. The new material must be able to be related to the understanding that we already hold. That is critical. That will lead to enriched understanding. Now that insight seems so logical, so straightforward, but it's central. 
and it gives us a central pillar which must underpin all teaching. The implications have become clear just in a moment. From the preface of his major book of 68 and 1978 when it was reissued, he said that if I had to reduce all of educational psychology to just one principle, <clears throat> I would say this. The most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Ascertain this and teach him accordingly. So true. The young learner is trying to make sense of what's being thrown at them. They use what they already understand in an attempt to make a sense of the new material. We as teachers must know what they already understand and how they understood it and tie the two together. You see, we must have some insight about what the learners already understand. <clears throat> now, if we taught them the previous year, we may know that. If we didn't teach them the previous year, then perhaps we've got to listen to them, question and discuss with them to find out. And we've then got to make the clear links between what we're giving them and what they already have because we're seeking enriched understanding. <coughs> we're not seeking memorization of information. We want them to make sense of the new material. That's natural for them. That's what they naturally want to do. Now let's see if we can help them do it. Osjabal gives us the principles. His insights were so clear and brilliant. His book is still worth reading today. If meaningful learning, he described it as making sense, something understood, and the definition of understanding it is can be used in a novel situation with some prospect of success. Now that distinguishes just knowing information from understanding its meaning and significance so you can use it. Now if education is of any value, it must be useful. Now rote learning, he described it in these kind of terms. New materials is stored in the brain unconnected to other information, understandings or insights. You've just taken it in and stored it in a box. It's not going to be useful. It's not going to help us. In general, there are a few exceptions. For example, it's useful in rote learning, for example, to know your times tables in simple arithmetic or the alphabet in English in the right order. But then you do apply these things and you do relate them to other things in life. Reception learning, that's his phrase. That's where the teacher is in control. But the teacher can be in control by lots and lots of different ways. Talking, showing, questioning, worksheets, textbooks, computer programs. The teacher has to d laid out the method of learning and that is the normal thing that's going to happen in most schools and university classes. Discovery learning, and he defined that, the learners free to explore, make their own discoveries and gain their own understandings. Now we'll come back to discovery learning in a moment. Ojibal was skeptical of its value, but his contemporary Jerome Brunner looked at that in more detail and that brought up interesting insights. Now this diagram takes a bit of thinking about. Osjabal has defined rote learning and meaningful learning across the page. Up and down the page, reception, discovery. Reception, where it's teacher control, discovery, they're free to make their own discoveries. Meaningful, they can make sense of it. Rote, they just put it by in, their, in a box in their memory. Now what he showed was that these two axes are unconnected. You can have meaningful learning where the teacher is totally at the center. You can have meaningful learning where they're discovering things entirely for themselves. It doesn't matter where you are in the reception discovery line. It can be meaningful. But equally, it could be wrote. You could have teacher-centered learning where they just memorize, but equally you can have discovery learning where they just memorize. 
Now, you've got to ponder this through very carefully because this is absolutely fundamental. The two things are not connected. And he demonstrated that again and again. Other people have picked it up in the literature. Sadly, it's not got into the educationist literature in enough detail. Back to original picture. Examples. Facts, names, conventions, rules. Teacher-centred, given, they memorise them. A lot of learning that young people, indeed we all make outside school, is by making our own discoveries, and it's highly meaningful. But we also discover by trial and error, principles, algorithms, ways of doing things. We don't understand why they work, but they do. And you can see that in life as well. But inside schools, and indeed universities as well, the teacher has organised the learning and the goal is meaningful. Well, that's the theoretical goal, and in many countries teachers are remarkably successful at it. The trouble is, the people who decide policy in education are not aware of it. So summarising the great contribution of David Osgebel, Understanding is strongly controlled by what you already understand. And meaningful learning, which is our goal, making sense of, you can get that with teacher-centered or discovery strategies anywhere. In other words, the strategy is not critical. It's how you use the strategy. We'll see in a moment in the work of Johnston why that's true. So that leads to fallacy three. I have seen that kind of statement made so often. It's not true. The teaching strategy is not the key. It's how you use the teaching strategies that, that's the key. And that's what he demonstrated through his research, that the teaching approach is unconnected with the extent of understanding. People talk about modern ways of teaching, as if they're going to give better understanding. They might do, but they might equally make it worse. And there are hundreds of papers that show this, that have come out subsequently. Just look at that paper. Now these are three world eminent figures in their field. The journal is a top journal. Why minimal guidance during instruction does not work. An analysis of the failure of constructivist discovery, problem-based experiential and inquiry-based learning. They're not saying these are wrong. They're not saying they don't have a place. They're not saying they're not valuable. They don't hold the key, which is exactly what David Osgebel was saying in different language decades before from his research. This is a review paper, and I think that paper should be mandatory reading for everybody, in any, everybody involved in teacher education and indeed for all teachers. A paper really worth reading. Robert Gagne, very different background. He was a subject instructor different kind of set of skills, but his students were still learning. And in this business he was breaking down complex learning tasks into a series of small stages, and it worked extremely well. The idea of logical planning and all teaching, it's so important, but the logic of us as teachers doesn't always match the logic of our students. So we've got to be a bit careful in this and not impose our logic in every case, but in subject instructing, it is absolutely essential. You see, our students, particularly school students, don't necessarily learn the way that we think they should, maybe the way we did. We've got to be sensitive and listen. How important. That leads to fallacy four. 
Teachers are highly skilled professionals. If only the wider public and our politicians would accept that. But it's not possible to, un to know exactly how our learners are going to do their learning. The principles they're going to learn by are fixed. But you find they've got all kinds of unexpected ways to get it, particularly when faced with an examination. It's worth doing this. I have done this. <clears throat> Sit with a student and let them talk through as they complete a question, like an examination question. Once they trust you and they just talk through, I'm doing this because I think this might work. This is the right approach. It blows your mind. So summarising Robert Gagne's great insights, primary teachers know that particularly well. We've got to get into the mindset of the learners. Yes, the principles by which they learn are fixed, but the detailed way of their logic may not be adult logic. They don't think, see things in exactly the same way. To Jerome Brunner, no, the dates are not a mistake. <clears throat> he lived over 100 years. He experimented with discovery learning in a very prodigious research center in the USA. <clears throat> that is simply true. Young learners are just naturally exploring the environment. The tragedy is, when school education starts, we're in real danger of just squashing that natural curiosity out. We organize and systematize learning. Youngsters want to explore. They want to understand. They do not want to sit in lines and be told. But as he studied it, he discovered that there's a real place for the teacher. You can't give them total freedom. There's no way they're going to discover the great insights that took the human race thousands of years to get to. They're not going to discover that in an afternoon. We need to give a structure. Now, out of that came two very important developments. Guided discovery learning has been shown to be extremely successful in science education. Discovery learning doesn't work. <coughs> That's been tried. It needs clear teacher guidance. And there were science curricula set up in my country, Scotland, in the 1960s, 70s, that were built around guided discovery learning. And now looking back with the wisdom of hindsight at the impact of these curricula shows just how successful they were. The young people just loved it. In fact, for decades, the sciences, even physics and chemistry, were the most popular subjects where youngsters had to choose what they had to do. And greater numbers chose these than any other discipline. Because guided discovery allowed the youngster the natural freedom, the natural instinct to try and make sense of, to discover, make it for themselves. But it needed strict guidance and structure. Much later, <clears throat> a book published by Robinson, references at the end, he demonstrated the importance of creativity and divergent thought. And our education world today is often losing that because we're dominated by exams and comparing teachers, schools and nations, which is destroying education. And he demonstrates that very clearly. So summarising his work, <clears throat> we need to have that freedom. Young people need to have freedom to create, to think things through, lateral thinking, divergent thought, generating new ideas. And that means we've got to cut down the content. 
and countries that have reduced their content in their curricula, it does allow time for this and their education is enriched. And the Scottish experience in the sciences, which also was in mathematics to an extent, demonstrates the truth of this. And still today the science base of Scotland <clears throat> is amongst the strongest in the world. It's said that there is more spending and research in the sciences in Scotland per head of population than any other country in the world. Certainly the numbers electing to go to university to study in all the sciences and applied sciences is huge. But we need time, less content. That's a great message from Brunner. <clears throat> Finally, <clears throat> he started by looking at areas of difficulty. Study after study where he directed PhD students from all countries of the world, it started to become evident <clears throat> that the difficulties arose when there was too much information for the human mind to handle. That led him on to see that this was connected to the working memory capacity. He then took that model and tested it. And because he taught in a university chemistry department, he applied it in laboratory learning and university lecture courses to start with. But it's been applied at school level. The findings are quite dramatic. They're quantitative. And it shows that the key to understanding it lies in the limitations of working memory capacity. That's the key. That's the key to all understanding. And we've got to build that in as central in education today. It led to the idea of information processing. <clears throat> there are literally hundreds of papers, indeed books, about this. Sadly, it's strangely ignored in much teacher education. But course, what is demonstrated by careful research is the way our human brains handle what comes at us. We're being battered with things from all around us all the time. How does the brain handle it? And we all handle it in basically the same way. We're surrounded by things coming at us. Subconsciously within our brains we have what we call a perception filter. Some people call it sensory memory. That filters out all the information that flies at us through our senses. And only a very small amount gets into the working memory. The working memory is not large. And there are good biological reasons why it cannot be large. Most of our brain is that, a long-term memory. And we store things that the working memory passes on. It doesn't have to pass on everything. But we store things we know, understand. But it also stores our attitudes, feelings, biases. And the evidence suggests that the long-term memory is infinite capacity. The working memory has got very restricted capacity. It's tiny. But what's in there controls what you select in. That's tying in with what David Osherable found. You'll find that diagram with minor variations in language and layout all over literature. It should be central in all teacher education. It's the key to everything because in one diagram it makes sense of the whole process of learning. But let's focus on the working memory for the moment. <clears throat> in the adult population, that's people over age 16, we can hold on average seven things. What the original research who measured it in the 1950s, this is old stuff, he described them as chunks. What we see is a unit of information. But some people can hold eight, 
a few at nine, some at six, a few at five, not many outside that range. And the size of your working memory grows naturally biologically with age. And it gets to its completeness about age 16, which ties in with the findings of Jean Piaget. Medical researchers can tell us where the working memory is. It's in two linked sites. It does the work. That's where you think. That's where you understand. That's where you solve problems. And that's the only part of the brain that does it. So if you overload it, it can't function. It just doesn't work. You can't get around it. You can't expand it. And it's nothing to do with ability. It's just the way our brains are wired up. There are again hundreds, maybe more, papers in the literature built around working memory. Now there are those who say, oh, it doesn't matter. Most people have got a working memory around about seven, some six or eight, very few at five or nine. The differences are very small, they're not important. That's not true. The evidence contradicts it. You can measure its capacity very easy. There are two at least standard tests. The limitations of your working memory, the size that you've got, that you've been born with, it offers a very powerful control on understanding. And if we understand that as teachers, we can make learning much more efficient, and studies have shown that. That's the key, not the teaching method. Just to illustrate this, culled from a book, referenced at the end, here's just a few studies. Various countries, built around the sciences mainly, but not always. Pearson correlation, that's between the success in a test or examination and the working memory size, which has been measured. The samples in general are large. Every study shows probability of scale. And you look at the bottom line, there's one study that's got a correlation of 0.81. Mind-blowing. Now the size of the correlation value has nothing to do with the discipline, it's nothing to do with the country, this is culture-free. The size of the correlation coefficient is to do with the actual assessment test, the questions asked and how they were asked. The size of your working memory controls success. The range, that's typical. It has a powerful effect on understanding. There are those who say that. It's not true. If you measure the working memory capacity of a class of university students, you find they've got the same range as any other group in society of adults. And yet university students presumably have more intelligence. They certainly have achieved more. It's how you use what you've got that's important, not the size of what you've got. But too often the size of what you've got is hindering our students. That's something we can put right. I quote just three studies. In these three, just the written material was recast to minimize working memory overload. It was done deliberately so that those with smaller, smaller working memories would cope better. It's like rewriting a few chapters of a textbook. No alteration of what was to be taught, no alteration of the time of teaching, no alteration of teachers, the teachers were not even trained in it, just given a new textbook. No alteration in the assessment, and in all three, the performance of the student's school level, various ages and stages, in all three, it improved markedly, in every case, of scale, probability, less than one in a thousand that this could have happened by chance. In one of the studies the attitudes were measured and interestingly they found that the attitudes to the subject improved quite dramatically. In fact looking at it it's some of the most dramatic changes I've ever seen anywhere in the literature. 
If you can understand, it makes your learners happy. They want to study it. It can be done. We need to do it. We know how to do it, if only we applied it. Let's just bring it all together. This has been a very quick survey, just to pick out some of the key landmarks of the area. There's a reference list and some other references and books that you can refer to afterwards. You need to look at this, think it through, work it through. All of us. That defines a human being. That's the way we were designed. We're pattern-seeking, sense-making. We're full of curiosity naturally. We're highly creative and questioning. All of us. Yes, we develop cognitively to about age 16. We've got to work within that. And primary teachers are very well aware of that. They may not use the same language, but they tailor it to the right age. We've got to relate what we're giving to what they already understand, which means we must know what they already understand and how they came to understand it. And we've got to be creative because our young people are creative in the ways they seek to gain understanding. Yes, it's a social activity. Language is a key tool. These are things we've got to look at and there's a vast research evidence on both. But the teaching method we use doesn't control the learning success. It's how you use the method. If you do it within the limitations of working memory, you'll get great outcomes. If you don't do it within the limitations of working memory, you won't get great outcomes. And again, there are many papers that show that. Remember, understandings are constructed. I see in the literature phrases like constructing knowledge. You can't construct knowledge. Knowledge is out there whether you know it or not. In the brain, we construct understandings. We're making sense of what's out there. That's what we construct. Important principles. And I'm suggesting that's the central goal. Understanding in the broader sense of that word. Because when we understand something, we can use that understanding in life around. We can apply it. We can use it. Education has to have a value in practice. But I'll leave you with this, and there'll be a later presentation that focuses on this. The single most important finding, the single most important finding, the recognition that working memory, a tiny part of the human brain, is where we think, understanding, and solve problems. It's the only part of the brain where we can do it. And learning success in terms of understanding is controlled. Correlation doesn't show this, but there are studies that have shown it. It's controlled by the limited capacity of working memory. If we arrange our teaching with that in mind, we will get greater student learning success. That is the key. That is the key to understanding. Now, this is a bit cluttered. I've covered a lot of people. One early paper, a summary paper of human memory and cognition at the beginning, the work of Ojibwe. Badley is one of the key people on memory, particularly working memory. Endless papers and books. The work of Brunner, a study on improving performance of so Danili, Gagne's work, applying the working memory findings in primary schools, the work, great work of Gatherco. Hussein's study showing how working memory controls the difficulties in chemistry and how to improve it. Papers by Johnston showing the key principles. The paper by Kirshner and his colleagues which challenges their thinking. Miller, the paper of 1956, the first person who measured the capacity of working memory. Quantitatively easy to do. Brilliant work. 
He called it short-term memory in those days, but we now know it's working memory. The book by Robinson, which is a wonderful read. A challenging book by Shell and his colleagues there, the unified learning model, built around working memory. Everything's built around it. The work of Vygotsky in translation, but this I picked the one called Mind in Society. And then a summary looking back at the work of Piaget. Now you'll find a lot of it in one textbook. Chapters 2, 3 and 4 cover this. And there are hundreds of references in there. So it'll give you a starting point for anything you want to pursue and follow up on. Make sure your library gets the book. Yes, it's a hard battle education, pushing the boulder up the hill. Basically, we all learn in the same way. But we do know that there are variations within these broad principles, and that's where the confusion lies. Get the principles like, right now look at the variations, and that's going to be the theme of the next presentation, where we're going to move on into that area.